Number four, Sattler, Munster, and Simons. Ooh. Before I get to talk about Michael Sattler, this is a painting from the year 2011. <laughs> the only image I could find of him on the internet. I want to talk to you about the Anabaptist distinctives. And so if you could pull out your Anabaptist profile and we could fill that in a little bit together, that would be helpful. Their, their belief system came to them from the reformed mindset of Ulrich Zwingli. Okay? So it, it are, I'm, not, I'm not going to cover all the things that he had already rejected from the Catholicism. I'm just going to tell you the things that are distinctive to the Anabaptists that make them different than the other Reformation people. Of course, they use the Bible as a standard. That's, that's very big for the Anabaptists. It's big for every, everybody, really, in the Reformation. But for the Anabaptists, they, they don't, they don't um, make as many exceptions as other people do, like Luther. For example, when Luther reads the Sermon on the Mount, he sees a list of things that you're supposed to do that he feels are, import, are impossible because you're just a pathetic maggot and you can't even make a positive move towards God. And so for Luther, the Sermon on the Mount is there to teach you how pathetic you are and how incapable you are of keeping God's laws so that you cry out for faith in faith for mercy. For the, for the Anabaptists, the Sermon on the Mount is a manual for life. They're just like, we're going to do it, literally. And so that's, that's, that's for them uh, something they refer to a lot, the Sermon on the Mount. Very important for them. Whereas for Luther... What's important is Romans, um, Galatians, you know, so they're majoring on different parts of the Bible. Anabaptists believe you have to be converted. That's also a difference. Other, for everyone else, you're born into it. So, for example, once a village adopts a Protestant mindset, then all the babies will be baptized into the Protestant religion. You're not, you're not uh, converted, you're born into it. So for the Anabaptists, you have to be converted, which means repenting specifically of a sinful lifestyle. They're very interested in lifestyle, less interested in justification and faith alone and these other things that they believed in to some degree, but more interested in lifestyle. They, uh, other distinctives is they, believe, they did not believe in taking oaths. They believed... A, a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them believed in sharing uh, money. The word for sharing is uh, koine or kini in Greek, and it's the, where we get the word, uh, it's related to the word communism. And so the Anabaptists would often share all their possessions. Not every group, but a number of them would do that. And they believed in loving their enemies. They, they, they really majored on that doctrine. Uh, they thought that was very important. And that's really interesting because in this period that we're looking at, there were over 5,000 Anabaptist martyrs. I mentioned three. Actually, the first one died of a disease. So I really only mentioned Felix Mons and George Blaurock. But there were over 5,000 of these guys, and they wrote a book about it documenting all of them called The Martyr's Mirror. And if any of you ever heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a, a thick book of all Christian martyrs from the earlier centuries, uh, the Martyr's Mirror, which is just the Anabaptist martyrs, is way thicker than Fox's Book of Martyrs. And so they have a history of, of their people. And uh, probably the most famous one is a, is a gentleman named Dirk Willems. I get to use my whiteboard now. Dirk Willems, not a very common name in our part of the world, but uh, Dirk Willems died on May 16, 1569 in Aspirin, Holland. What happened is he was arrested for being an Anabaptist. It was a crime to be a part of the, the free church, the voluntary church, and to um, participate in it. So he got arrested, and he was brought to a a palace that had been converted into a prison. And while he was there, he was subsisting on rations, slight rations of food, 
and he had lost a, a significant amount of weight, and he was able to tie, he was up in a tower, he was able to tie together rags to make a ladder. And he climbed out his window and successfully made it all the way down to the ground and started running away. And he ran over a pond that had thin ice on it. But since he had been losing so much weight from all the rations that he had at prison, he was able to make it safely across. But when he got, um, when he got across, the, uh, the, one of the guards had realized that he escaped and chased after him, who was much heavier afoot and fell through the ice, which is essentially a death uh, sentence because the, the more you struggle against it, the more ice falls in with you. And the other guards, who were also alerted to the situation, were afraid to go on the ice lest they fall in too. So Dirk has a clean getaway, and he remembers in his mind that Jesus says to love your enemies, and he decides to go back. He goes back to the guy struggling in the icy water, and he rescues him because he figures that's what Christ would want him to do. And so he pulls the guy to shore, and the other guards recapture Dirk and bring him back up to the tower, and they burn him at the stake shortly after that. And so he becomes, for the Anabaptists, the poster child, you know, the, the main guy that illustrates with his blood the kind of deep uh, commitment and ethic that they're talking about when they say, love your enemies, even unto death. Really an amazing story. Uh, another, another distinctive for the Anabaptists, distinctive belief, is the separation from the world. Luther would say, if you are called upon to be the hangman, that you are not acting on behalf of Christ, you're acting on behalf of the city government, and you chop the head off, or you pull the rope, or whatever they ask you to do as the executioner, and maybe you have love in your heart, but you, know, you're, you, you are fully allowed to, to participate in that. And Anabaptists would say, absolutely not. We are to be separate from the world. And so they would take that in, in uh, a sense of no civic engagement, no participation in government, um, no participation in Catholic churches, which they consider to be part of the world, uh, no participation in Protestant churches, which they consider to be part of the world. And so they were uh, very much an isolated, uh, had an isolated mindset. They didn't believe you couldn't talk to, to people or interact with them in your daily business, but they, but they were not partaking of, uh, they're not going to the pub, that's for sure. Um, and uh, they're, they're not <clears throat> going to these public areas either for entertainment. They also had home fellowships. They did not uh, have churches because they were persecuted. If they built a church, they would get torn, torn down. <laughs> so they met in homes. As far as the way they did church government, they had something called a congregational polity. Polity is related to the word politics, which is related to the word polis, which means city. It's a word for government. And so congregational polity is the people choose the pastor. And uh, other forms are episcopal, episcopal polity. Uh, that's where you have bishops that determine who's in charge of each church. And then uh, presbyterian polity is, pres presbyteros uh, is the word for elder. Uh, it's where the elders make decisions, Okay. Uh, so the, the uh, Anabaptists decide to go with a congregational approach to church government. It's kind of unique to them as opposed to the other groups. As far as modern heirs go, we have not too many of these Anabaptists that survived. Again, nothing to do with the Baptists whatsoever. Um, the uh, biggest group are the Mennonites, about 1.5 million. Then there's a group called the German Baptists, not to be confused with what we think of as Baptists, about 1.5 million of them. Then there are the Amish, come out of this same movement. And there are about a quarter million of them. And then Hutterites, and there are not quite so many of them, 
6.05 million. Uh, if you add it all up, you get about 3.3 million. You don't need to write down all the individual things unless you want to, but 3.3 million is our number for surviving Anabaptists uh, in the 21st century. Okay, so that's just a few things about them. Next week, we're going to look at the Sicinians, which is a group that is uh, like the Anabaptists, but they don't believe in the Trinity. So uh, stay tuned for that. But uh, for now, what I want to talk to you about are these three things. Michael Sattler, this gentleman, the Munster fiasco, which could definitely uh, make quite a movie. I think it's, it's been made into plays and movies and so on. And then last of all, Menno Simons. So Michael Sattler, he was born in the 1490s, 1495 to 1527. How long did he live? About 32, right? He became a Benedictine monk. That's how he started out, a Benedictine monk. monk. So he is somebody who's de dedicated his life to serving God under the medieval Catholic system. He's uh, taken vows, and he's supposed to be celibate for life, and he's supposed to serve in a Benedictine manner. Uh, involves working uh, part of the day, praying part of the day, and uh, other activities. It's not just like sitting in a room by yourself. And at a certain point, he gets disillusioned with the worldliness and the pomp that he sees in the monastery. And in 1525, a whole bunch of people end up fighting in the Peasants' War that come near his monastery, and it gets overrun with troops fighting. And so he, he flees from the monastery, and he ends up uh, leaving, leaving the monastery for good, and he decides that he wants to um, marry a nun. So he marries a, a nun. <coughs> I mean, if you're a monk, who, who better to understand you, right? Luther married a nun. Michael Sattler married a nun, too. Her name was Margaretha, Margaret for us. And so he marries uh, Margaret, and he comes to Zurich. And in 1525, he enters the city. This is the same time when all this chaos is going on between Zwingli and Grebel about infant baptism and everything else, and they're, and they're kicking these guys out. And so Michael Sattler somehow or other manages to get dis expelled from the city as well in 1525, and he associates with this group of Anabaptists that I've been talking about, and he gets baptized in 1526 and officially joins their group. He is a very strong missionary in a number of cities, in Hoare, Brattenburg, and Strasbourg, and he is the author of a, a document called the Schleitheim Confession of 1527. It's, it's a place, Schleitheim, and this is a confession they came up with. This, more than anything else, helps us to understand what the Anabaptist people believed at that time. And this is going to be very important as we transition to talk about Munster, because in, Mus in Munster, which, what we basically have is a weirdo, wacko cult group and lots of weird activity and violence and polygamy and slaughter and torture, and we're going to get into all that. But people will typically say they were Anabaptists who took over the city of Munster, but if, if the Schleitheim Confession is what the Anabaptists say they believe, there's no way they took over a city, declared polygamy, and slaughtered everyone who disagreed with them. Okay? And uh, so that's kind of the point I'm, I'm going for here. But here are the seven points. Uh, number one is that baptism is only for those who repent. It's not for babies. Number two is called the ban. And the way that works is that if somebody slips and falls into sin, you're supposed to talk to them. And if they don't respond bring uh, two or three with you and talk to them again. If they still don't respond, then you put them under the ban. The ban means they're, they're kicked out from communion. They're not allowed to participate in communion anymore. Uh, as time goes on, different Anabaptist groups disagree on how severe the ban should be. And Menno Simons, in particular, adopts a, a doctrine called shunning which is to say, if somebody's under the ban, then nobody can even talk to that person at all. And the Mennonites end up banning and shunning each other a lot and sp <laughs> splitting apart over, over time. Um, but anyhow, that's the ban. Uh, originally just a ban from communion. 
if you are falling into this kind of sin. Number three, uh, communion is only for those who are, uh, you know, serious. You know, they have repented and so on. Number four, separation from the world or from evil. Uh, I've already talked about that. Uh, for them, they understood it as no participation in government as well as Catholic and Protestant churches. Number five, the pastors should uh, be men of good reputation, and their job is teaching, disciplining, carrying out the ban, leading in prayer, and the sacraments. Not all seven, but just uh, baptism and communion. Number six, they believe that you should never use a sword. Number seven, you should never take any oaths. So these are the seven things that they agree, this, this group agrees on. All right, now I want to show you the trial. It was rare that we get one of these. So I couldn't control myself, and I put the whole thing in your notes. This is the trial and execution of Michael Sattler. He's essentially arrested with his home fellowship. His wife and his whole home fellowship is all arrested at once. And the, he, there are nine charges against him. Here are the nine charges. First, that he and his adherents have acted contrary to the mandate of the emperor. Two, he has taught, held, and believed that the body and blood of Christ are not present in the sacrament. Thirdly, he has taught and believed that infant baptism does not conduce to salvation. Fourthly, they have rejected the sacrament of extreme unction, which is uh, anointing of the sick. Last rites, also sometimes called. Fifthly, they have despised and condemned the mother of God and the saints. Sixthly, he has declared that men are not to swear before the authorities. Seventhly, he has commenced a new and unheard of custom in regard to the Lord's Supper, placing the bread and wine on a plate and eating and drinking the same. So he's serving the bread and the wine, not just the bread. <laughs> unheard of. Totally shocking. Eighthly, he has left the order and married a wife. Well, they got him there. He definitely did that. Ninthly, he has said that if the Turks... Now, this is really the interesting one. He has said that if the Turks should invade the country, no resistance ought to be offered them. And if it were, if it were right to wage war, he would rather take the field against the Christians than against the Turks. And it is certainly a great matter to set the greatest enemies of our holy faith against us. The Muslims! Not much has changed there, huh? Thereupon, Michael Sattler requested permission. So this is actually a quote from Martyr's Mirror, that book of uh, the Anabaptist heroes who died for the faith. Thereupon, Michael Sattler requested permission to confer with his brothers and sisters, which was granted him. Having conferred with them for a little while, he began and undauntingly answered thus. And he goes through, I'm not going to read all this to you. I think it might get a little wearisome. But he goes through and systematically responds in basically a paragraph to each of those nine charges. All right? We're going to pick it up when he says, in conclusion. Can you guys scan ahead to where it says, in conclusion, after... Or no, let's, let's read the Turks one, because that's, that's really interesting. Eighthly, you see where it says, eighthly, if the Turks should come? Eighthly, if the Turks should come, this is his response to that, we ought not to resist them, for it is written, thou shalt not kill. We must not defend ourselves against the Turks and others of our persecutors, but are to beseech God with earnest prayer to repel and resist them. But then I said that if warring were right, I would rather take the field against so-called Christians who persecute, apprehend, and kill pious Christians than the, against the Turks was for this reason. The Turk is a true Turk, knows nothing of the Christian faith, and is a Turk after the flesh, but you who would be Christians and who make your boast of Christ, persecute the pious witnesses of Christ and are Turks after the Spirit. <laughs> now that is, I mean, he's on trial for his life here. This is not a play. This is not a sermon. This is not uh, a newspaper soundbite. He's on trial for his life. That's what he says. In conclusion, then he calls them ministers of God. Because you know why that is? Because Romans 13 says the government is a minister of God and it does not wield the sword in vain. It's, it's the, the sword, God gives a sword to the government to do that. Ye ministers of God, I admonish you to consider the end for which God has appointed you, to punish the evil and to defend and protect the pious. So that's what they're supposed to do. He's calling them to do what they're supposed to do. 
Whereas then we have not acted contrary to God or the gospel, and you will find that neither I nor my brothers and sisters have offered or offended in word or deed against any authority. Therefore, ye ministers of God, if you have not heard or read the word of God, sin for the most learned and for the sacred books of the Bible, of whatsoever language they may be, and let them confer with us in the word of God. And if they prove to us with the Holy Scriptures that we err and are in the wrong, we will gladly desist and recant and also willingly suffer the sentence and punishment for that of which we have been accused. But if no error is proven to us, I hope to God that you will be converted and receive instruction. Whew. Upon this speech, the judges laughed and put their heads together, and the town clerk of Inzesheim said, Oh, you infamous, desperate villain and monk, shall we dispute with you? The hangman shall dispute with you, I assure you. So I don't think his, his words <laughs> penetrated the heart much, did they? Michael said, God's will be done. The town clerk said, it were well if you had never been born. Michael replied, God knows what is good. Town clerk, you arch heretic, you have seduced the pious. If they would only now forsake their error and accept the grace. Michael, grace is with God alone. One of the prisoners also said, we must not depart from the truth. Town clerk, you desperate villain and arch heretic. I tell you, if there were no hangman here, I would hang you myself and think that I had done God's service. Michael God will judge all right. Thereupon the town clerk said a few words to him in Latin, what we do not know. Michael answered him, judica, which means judge, adjudicate. The town clerk then admonished the judges and said, he will not cease from this talk today. Therefore, my lord, judge, proceed with the sentence. I will commit it to the law. The judge asked Michael Sattler whether he also committed it to the law. He replied, flip the page, Ye ministers of God, I am not sent to judge the word of God. We are sent to bear witness of it. Hence, cannot consent to any law, since we have no command from God concerning it. But if we cannot be discharged from the law, we are ready to suffer for the word of God, whatever sufferings are or may be imposed upon us for the sake of our faith in Christ Jesus, our Savior, as long as we have breath in us, unless we be dissuaded from it by the Scriptures. Sounds just like Luther at the Diet of Worms where he said, unless you can show me by Scripture, I can't recant. Different end result, though. The town clerk said, the hangman shall convince you, he shall dispute with you, arch heretic. Michael, I appeal to the Scriptures. Then the judges arose, went in another room where they remained for an hour and a half and determined on the sentence. In the meantime, some in the room treated Michael Sattler most unmercifully, heaping reproach upon him. One of them said, What have you an expectation for yourself and the others that you have so seduced him? With this, he also drew forth a sword which lay upon the table, saying, See, with this they will dispute with thee. But Michael did not answer upon a single word concerning his person, but willingly endured it all. One of the prisoners said, We must not cast pearls before swine. <laughs> so they weren't going to continue preaching. Being also asked why he had not remained a lord in the convent, Michael answered, According to the flesh I was a lord, but it is better so. He did not say more than what is recorded here, and this he spoke fearlessly. All right, then we get the sentence. The judges having returned to the room, the sentence was read. It was as follows. Here is Michael Sattler's sentence. Now, again, going back to the nine charges against him, he, did not, he, he has the unheard of custom of, of offering wine in communion. He, he doesn't pray to the, the mother of God and the saints. Um, he said that, you know, we shouldn't offer resistance to the Turks. I mean, would, whichever one of the nine things you pick, are you going to think death penalty for this guy? Right? But that's, that's what ends up happening. Sentence is read, in the case of the governor of his imperial majesty versus Michael Sattler, judgment is passed that Michael Sattler shall be delivered to the executioner who shall lead him to the place of execution and cut out his tongue. Then throw him upon a wagon and there tear, tear his body twice with red hot tongs 
and after he has been brought without the gate, he shall be pinched five times in the same manner. After this had been done in the manner prescribed, he was burned to ashes as a heretic. His fellow brethren were ex executed with the sword, and the sisters drowned. His wife also, after being subjected to many entreaties, admonitions, and threats, under which she remained very steadfast, was drowned a few days afterwards. Done the 21st of May, A.D. 1527. In fact, what happened is they, they brought him out of the city, and they messed up cutting his tongue out. They didn't cut enough of it out so he could still speak. <laughs> and he still preached to the people and urged them towards repentance. And after they pinched his body with these red-hot tongues and mangled his flesh, they brought him to the place of execution. And customarily, when you, when you uh, burn... Sorry, this is so gruesome. But when you burn somebody at the stake, they die fairly quickly because of the smoke. They die of asphyxiation. And so they devised a method to make it last a lot longer. They, hung, they, they attached him to a ladder. And they would lean the ladder over the fire until he was about to pass out, and then they would lift it back up so that he would revive, and then do that over and over again until he really uh, actually burned as opposed to just died of uh, asphyxiation. Just, just a horrible, horrible uh, story. An incredible man, whether you agree with him or not, you have to admit the guy stuck true to his principles, and he wasn't... Um, he wasn't going to budge, you know, no matter how they mangled his body or tortured him, he wasn't going to budge um, for his testimony. All right, now let's talk about Munster. Munster has nothing to do with that Frankenstein-looking character from the TV show, the black and white TV show. Munster has nothing to do with cheese. That's from a French town. This is a German city. Um, it's this sprawling city in uh, ancient... Uh, Germany, or not ancient Germany, but 500 years ago, that's what it, <clears throat> what it looked like. And it's still around today. It's a major tourist town today, over 300,000 uh, people in it in uh, the 21st century in Germany. And so there is this whole situation that happened here that I have to tell you about, and it's, it's definitely not PG. So here we go. I think it's, it will serve as a good contrast to Michael Sattler. After the German Peasants' War in 1524-25, there was an attempt in the year 1532-35 to 35 to establish a new society in the city of Munster. This all started with this guy named Melchior Hoffman. I have him in your notes, right? Here's a drawing of him. Melchior Hoffman, 1495, again born in the 1490s, died in 1543. Um, he, he lasted until he was 48. He preached to people, and um, he believed... See, the reason why people get him confused with the Anabaptists is because he did believe in uh, adult baptism. He thought infant baptism was wrong as well, and so he ends up getting lumped in as an Anabaptist, but his, his beliefs are very different, as we'll come to see. Anyhow, he preached that people needed to be baptized in order to constitute a pure church of Christ to prepare for the return. He is what we would call an apocalypticist. 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 As, cl as close as I'm going to get. Um, I don't know if that's right or not. But apocalypticist is somebody who believes the end of the world is about to come. And Hoffman believed it would happen in 1533 in uh, the town of Strasbourg, Germany. Okay? So he, he's preaching that the end of the world is going to come in 1533 in Strasbourg and that that is going to be the new Jerusalem. He proclaims himself Elijah, the prophet. And the city council reacts by imprisoning him and Hoffman willingly turns himself over because he thinks the end of the world is coming like next year, so it's no big deal. And he ends up staying in prison for over a decade and dies there. However, while he's in prison, he writes prolifically and he spreads a lot of ideas. And um, he, he believes that before the return of Christ, the saints would rule the earth. Now, what I believe is that 
after the return of Christ, the saints will rule the earth. He believed before the return of Christ, the saints will rule the earth. Okay? And so this is what we might call an active apocalypticism. It's the idea that we bring about the end by establishing a world that is fit to receive the king, as opposed to a passive apocalypticism, which is you're waiting for Jesus to come to establish a world that is suitable for him. Okay, so he ends up in jail. In 1532, um, Munster became a haven for radicals, uh, which we also call Melchiorites. I don't know if I have that word in there for you. Okay, good. So Melchiorites are followers of Melchior, um, Melchior Hoffman, and they start pouring into this city of Munster in 1532. So the city ends up having three groups. You've got the Catholics, you've got some conservative Lutherans, and then you have these Melchiorites. In 1534, a radical priest named Rothman introduces adult baptism, Bernard Rothman. And at that point in 1534, a lot of the Catholic and Lutheran men begin to flee the city. The men flee, and they don't take the women with them because they're not convinced that this is, they think it's going to blow over or this is going to be settled. And, and they, they, they have been accustomed to leaving their wives and children behind to conduct business. And so they, they left, and it just so ended up that uh, a lot of women were in the city and children. Uh, I mean, there are still men, but uh, a lot of these Catholics and Lutheran men were not there in the city anymore. And as they left, more of these Melchiorites came. And then we get in 1534 a guy named Jan or John um, Matthies. And he's a follower of Hoffman, and he declares Munster to be New Jerusalem. And so Matthies taught... He, now, he's, he's a real radical. He taught the godless have no right to live. Okay, now that is a radical teaching. Very different than Michael Sattler, who won't even fight the Turks. This guy says the godless have no right to even live. And that, um, you, so a lot of people, upon hearing this guy getting in power in the city, they take off too. They begin to flee. Everyone who remained was forcibly baptized in the marketplace. During this fiasco, a blacksmith challenged Matthies. He said, what do you think you're doing? Challenged him in front of everyone. Matthies killed him on the spot. At this point, the old bishop that used to be in charge of the religious matters of the cities went out and got himself an army and besieged the city. So at this point, the city is surrounded by soldiers, Catholic soldiers, and this bishop who's trying to take back his city from these wacko radicals who are forcibly converting everyone. And so in April, this is precious, in April 1534, Matthews attacks this significant army with knights and swords and everything else. He attacks them with only 30 followers claiming to be a second Gideon. He was wrong. He was easily killed, and so were all the rest of them, and they cut off his head and placed it on a pole for all in the city to see, and they nailed his genitals to the city gate. Whoa. At which point we get John of Leiden entering the this, this story, and he is worse than all the rest. He takes over as a king. He declares himself king. Now, the city is still surrounded by people. He has a very short reign. Just uh, for your information. He claims he has had visions of heaven, and he claims that he's David's successor. He's actually a tailor from a city called Harlem. Not New York, but I couldn't help but mention that. So he's really a tailor from the city of Harlem, but he's decided that he's now a king, and that he's hearing from God. And he goes out, and he succeeds in repelling the bishop's army. He goes out, and he's a little more organized, and he's a little more successful. And so... He comes back to the city and he starts wearing royal clothing, royal regalia, because he's the king and nobody's going to tell him what to do. And so he decides he's going to legalize polygamy and took 16 wives. I had another source that said 18, but we'll just go with 16. We'll hope that those two got away. Um, <clears throat> he really, really had a thing for Matthew's 
beautiful widow. But he was already married. Actually, he was already married twice. We won't talk about that. But uh, he was actually married to two women. So he wanted to marry Matthew's widow, and so he declared polygamy legal so then he could do that. And then, you know, three led to four, four led to, led to ten, and then 16 later, um, he's quite married. Part of what, what made him do this is that he believes in this active apocalypticism, which means we have to get the city ready to receive Jesus, and his belief is that the city needs to have 144,000 inhabitants. You've got all these women, three out of four of the people are women. How are you going to do that? City surrounded. He tells all the men to take as many wives as they want. And he develops a whole new theology based on the Old Testament patriarchs who had multiple wives to uh, bring that, to justify that. He executed 50 of the townsmen for resisting his vision. And there was one woman in the marketplace that he proposed to, and she said no. And so he cut her head off. After which, nobody else said no, I imagine. <laughs> it's just insane. He also established communism because most of the people were starving as a result of the year-long siege. So they had to share everything just to, to get by. And uh, he, he basically is, is a, in, in the Dutch language, they have a saying that roughly translates to pull a John Lydon which means putting too much effort into something. <laughs> and it, it like falls apart on you. Because what ends up happening in June 24th, 1535, is the, the soldiers with the Catholics are able to retake the city, and they capture it. I've got to show you a picture of John. There's, there's Johann or John or Jan Matthies von Harlem. And then here, very handsome looking guy. John of Leiden, he was known for his good looks. Sixteen wives, you know, good looking guy. Anyhow, he was captured, and this is a drawing uh, of the scene of torture. And sorry, this is gruesome again, but uh, they attach each of the, John of Leiden and his people, who, John was found hiding in a cellar when they captured the city, attached him to a pole by an iron spike collar, and they ripped his body with red hot tongs for an hour. That's what this guy's doing in the back. One of them saw the process of the torturing and attempted to kill himself with the collar, to choke himself, and they stopped him from doing that by tying him to the stake. Next, they pulled out the tongues with the tongs, and then they stabbed a burning dagger through the heart, which killed them. Then the bodies were placed in three cages and hung from the steeple of St. Lambert's Church, where they still are today, the three cages. On the left is St. Lambert's Church, a modern picture of it. And you can see there's a, a clock right here. Just above it, you can maybe make out there are these three rectangles, which are a close-up shot right here on the right side. The remains were left to rot in the cages as a warning lest anyone try this kind of thing again. And then 50 years later, they did remove the bones, which is why these cages are empty to this day. After this, the governments severely persecute the Anabaptists because they can't tell the difference between Melchior Hoffman, uh, John Matthies, and John of Leiden, and the other people who also are practicing adult baptism. All they know is they're going off the grid. So they associate them all together. And church history textbooks to this day make the same mistake. And they lump these guys in with the guys I was telling you about before. These guys are not the same beliefs. Um, and it doesn't matter because they end up getting severely persecuted. Which brings us at last to Menno Simons. Menno Simons was born in the 1490s just like everybody else, 1496, and he lives to 1561, God bless him, he, which in those days is a ripe old age. He studied Latin and Greek, and he studied the Latin church fathers. He was uh, a very well-informed person. Uh, maybe we wouldn't say a scholar in a university sense, but definitely a very learned person. And in 1515 or 1516, he became a priest and he says he had never read the Bible. 
Imagine that. You become an ordained priest. And yet he says he had never read the Bible before or during his priesthood. Out of fear that it would, he would be adversely influenced by it. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? All these people, what do they have in common? They're reading the Bible. They're challenging tradition. They're getting killed. He's like, I'm not going anywhere near that book. That book's dangerous. I'm just going to do what they tell me. I'm going to be a good priest. And I'm not going to mess with it. And then in 1526 or 1527, he questions the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is the idea that the, the bread literally becomes the body. Because he's, he's a priest. He knows. He knows that, you know what I mean? Like when, when everyone else sees the priest doing his thing, he looks, he looks quite impressive with his robe and his Latin words, right? But when, when, when you are the priest, you know what's going on. And so he's like, ah, I don't really know if when I say these words, it actually magically transforms this bread into the body of Christ and this wine into his blood. Because when I sip the wine, which nobody else does, except for me as a priest, it tastes just like the wine that we poured from the back room <laughs> before the service. And so he starts to question the transubstantiation. And that gets him to study the Scriptures. Which as soon as you do that, you're in trouble. I'm going to tell you that right now. At least if you want to just blend. So in 1531, he starts to hear about rebaptism, And he thought it was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard of. Rebaptism? Why would you want to do that again? And so he searched the scriptures and discovered that infant baptism was not in the Bible. And he discussed the issue with his superior. He's not, again, he's not a radical. He's, he's, a, he's a priest. He's trying to stay a priest. He discusses it with his superior who transfers him to another place. <laughs> transfers, that's how we dealt with it. Transfer him out. Where, and, and ironically, the place he transferred him to, he came in contact with the Anabaptists and their beliefs. And so he, he met some of the Munsterite disciples and was well, as well, but regarded them fanatical. So he met some of these guys, these Melchiorites that took over Munster. He, he met some of them and he thought, these guys are just wacko. In 1535, his brother died in the Munster conflict. And I'm not sure if he was participating in it or if he got stuck in the city or what exactly happened. But it really freaked out Menno. And it, it brought him to a place of conversion where he truly repented. Isn't that amazing? You have somebody who's a priest, who's serving God all this time. He's got no exposure to the Bible, and he hasn't repented yet. <laughs> Does anybody else see a problem with that? Okay, so he, he, these are his words. He prayed to God with sighs and tears that he would give to me, a sorrowing sinner, the gift of his grace. Create within me a clean heart, and graciously, through the merits of the crimson blood of Christ, he would graciously forgive my unclean walk and unprofitable life. Sounds like a contrite heart. So in 1536, he left the priesthood and he joined the Anabaptists. In 1537, he was ordained um, a pastor or a priest, whatever they would call it. And he rejects, he, he's really one of the main leaders after the Munster debacle who picks up the pieces and takes care of the people and leads them um, away, geographically away from the situation. And he goes to the Netherlands, and he finds relative peace there. And in 1544, as early as 1544, these followers of Menno Simons are called Mennonites, which is how they're known to this day. One of his very strong uh, doctrines, distinctive doctrines of the Mennonites and of Menno Simons that they practice rigorously, I mentioned already to you, was banning and shunning. And so what ended up happening over time is you'd have one group of Mennonites, and let's say Pat was caught in some sort of sin, and Claudia confronted her. And then Claudia took a couple others and they confronted Pat and Pat just blows them off, blows them off. Then brings it to the church and Pat's like, I'm not changing you guys. I've been here long. I've made more desserts than all the rest of you combined. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not giving it to this. And so we put her under the ban. 
okay? If she's under the ban, nobody's allowed to talk to her. So now if Craig starts talking to Pat, what do we do with Craig? Well, we, we <laughs> no, we don't kill him. <laughs> what do we do with Craig? We, we, bring, we, bring, we confront him, and then we bring two or three and confront him again, and we bring Craig before the church. And Craig says, I'm not going to stop talking to Pat. She, this is ridiculous. And so we put him under the ban. Now Lucky wants to, to talk to Craig. You see how it can spread from person to person until you've got two groups instead of one group? And then you, once you have two groups, each group mutually puts the other under the ban. And then, since they're so into it, then, then it splits into four groups. And this is historically what ended up happening. You, and then they eventually, over time, got back together. But they went through this whole excommunication um, period, the Mennonites, which, however psychologically troubling it sounds, and hard it might be to lose a friend because everyone's supposed to shun them and you're supposed to shun them too, however... Um, torturous that might sound to us, compare that to what everyone else was doing in their time. They drown no one. They burn no one at the stake. They behead no one. You know what I mean? So at least they're not killing people that disagree with them. They're just not talking to them. <laughs> so um, and he, another thing that he rejects, just a, a last point on Minnow, is he rejects asceticism. Asceticism is this idea, asceticism is uh, denying pleasure. This, this was an idea that had been around for a long time, and it made its way into Christianity fairly early on, that you're not supposed to enjoy anything, really. Um, but you're supposed to deny pleasure, uh, eat simple food, don't drink any, any alcohol, don't um, have any sex, don't do anything that would bring you pleasure, which is what the celibacy rule of the priest was, was kind of based on. So anyhow, uh, Menno denies this whole asceticism idea, and he, he embraces marriage, he embraces, you know, Things that are that God, he, he would say, things that God made that are good are to be enjoyed. And uh, he rejects that asceticism. So that's, that's it for Menno Simons. Next week, we are going to look at the Sassinians, who are, uh, uh, they have a couple of different names that they go by. They go by the Polish Brethren. They also go by... Um, uh, I don't remember what the Hungarian, the, the Transylvanian ones are called, but there's another group in Transylvania and another group in Italy. And we'll look at them next week and see what happened with them. Uh, just like to close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for having the, the, uh, the privilege, the joy to look at these things, to gain inspiration, to take... Uh, some of the good to leave behind the bad. We ask that you would help us to be inspired by people like Zwingli and Grable and Michael Sattler and, and the, these people and also to avoid the mistakes of, of the others. We pray that you would uh, help us to get home safely tonight and that you would bless us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he figures that's what Christ would want him to do. And so he pulls the guy to shore, and the other guards recapture Dirk and bring him back up to the tower, and they burn him at the stake shortly after that. And so he becomes, for the Anabaptists, the poster child, you know, the, the main guy that illustrates with his blood the kind of deep uh, commitment and ethic that they're talking about when they say, love your enemies, even unto death. Really an amazing story. Uh, Another, another distinctive for the Anabaptists, distinctive belief, is that separation from the world. Luther would say, if you are called upon to be the hangman, that you are not acting on behalf of Christ, you're acting on behalf of the city government, and you chop the head off, or you pull the rope, or whatever they ask you to do as the executioner, 
and maybe you have love in your heart, but you know you're, you you are fully allowed to to participate in that. And Anabaptists would say, absolutely not. We are to be separate from the world, and so they would take that in, in uh, a sense of no civic engagement, no participation in government. Um, no participation in Catholic churches, which they considered to be part of the world. Uh, no participation in Protestant churches, which they considered to be part of the world. And so they, what happened is he was arrested for being an Anabaptist. It was a crime to be a part of the, the free church, the voluntary church, and to um, participate in it. So he got arrested, and he was brought to a, a palace that had been converted into a prison. And while he was there, he was subsisting on rations, slight rations of food, and he had lost a, a significant amount of weight, and he was able to tie, he was up in a tower, he was able to tie together rags to make a ladder. And he climbed out his window and successfully made it all the way down to the ground and started running away. And he ran over a pond that had thin ice on it. But since he had been losing so much weight from all the rations that he had in prison, he was able to make it safely across. But when he got, um, when he got across, the, uh, the, one of the guards had realized that he escaped and chased after him, who was much heavier afoot and fell through the ice, which is essentially a death uh, sentence because the, the more you struggle against it, the more ice falls in with you. And the other guards, who were also alerted to the situation, were afraid to go on the ice lest they fall in too. So Dirk has a clean getaway, and he remembers in his mind that Jesus says to love your enemies, and he decides to go back. He goes back to the guy struggling in the icy water, and he rescues him. And so for Luther, the Sermon on the Mount is there to teach you how pathetic you are and how incapable you are of keeping God's laws so that you cry out for faith, in faith for mercy. For the, for the Anabaptists, the Sermon on the Mount is a manual for life. They're just like, we're going to do it, literally. And so that's, that's, that's for them uh, something they refer to a lot, the Sermon on the Mount. Very important for them. Whereas for Luther, what's important is Romans, um, Galatians. You know, so they're majoring on different parts of the Bible. Anabaptists believe you have to be converted. That's also a difference. Other, for everyone else, you're born into it. So, for example, once a village adopts a Protestant mindset, then all the babies will be baptized into the Protestant religion. You're not, you're not uh, converted, you're born into it. So for the Anabaptists, you have to be converted, which means repenting specifically of a sinful lifestyle. They're very interested in lifestyle less interested in justification and faith alone and these other things that they believed in to some degree, but more interested in lifestyle. They, uh, other distinctives is they, believe, they did not believe in taking oaths. They believed, uh, a, a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them believed in sharing uh, money. The word for sharing is uh, koine or kini in Greek, and it's the, where we get the word, uh, it's related to the word communism. And so the Anabaptists would often share all their possessions. Not every group, but a number of them would do that. And they believed in loving their enemies. They, they, they really majored on that doctrine. Uh, they thought that was very important. And that's really interesting because in this period that we're looking at, there were over 5,000 Anabaptist martyrs. I mentioned three. Actually, the first one died of a disease. So I really only mentioned Felix Mons and George Blaurock. But there were over 5,000 of these guys, and they wrote a book about it, documenting all of them, called The Martyr's Mirror. And if any of you ever heard of Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a, a thick book of all Christian martyrs from the earlier centuries, uh, The Martyr's Mirror, which is just the Anabaptist martyrs, is way thicker than Fox's Book of Martyrs. And so they have a history of, of their people. And uh, probably the most famous one is a, is a gentleman named Dirk Willems. I get to use my whiteboard now. Dirk Willems, not a very 
common name in our part of the world. But uh, Dirk Willems died on May 16, 1569 in Aspirin, Holland. Number four, Sattler, Munster, and Simons. Ooh. Before I get to talk about Michael Sattler, this is a painting from the year 2011. <laughs> the only image I could find of him on the internet. I want to talk to you about the Anabaptist distinctives. And so if you could pull out your Anabaptist profile, and we could fill that in a little bit together that would be helpful. Their, their belief system came to them from the reformed mindset of Ulrich Zwingli. Okay? So it, it, I'm, not, I'm not going to cover all the things that he had already rejected from the Catholicism. I'm just going to tell you the things that are distinctive to the Anabaptists that make them different than the other Reformation people. Of course, they use the Bible as a standard. That's, that's very big for the Anabaptists. It's big for every, everybody, really, in the Reformation. But for the Anabaptists, they, they don't, they don't um, make as many exceptions as other people do, like Luther. For example, when Luther reads the Sermon on the Mount, he sees a list of things that you're supposed to do that he feels are, import, are impossible because you're just a pathetic maggot and you can't even make a positive move towards God. 